Our guest today on The Career Musician is Richie Pena, drummer, producer, programmer to the stars and beyond. Richie has worked with the likes of Babyface, Anthony Hamilton, Boys to Men, Jordan Sparks, CC Winans, Ariana Grande, India Ari, Natalie Grant, Tori Kelly, Toby Mac, Andrea Bocelli, Tony Braxton, Josh Groban, David Foster, Charlie Puth, Seal, and countless others. Trust me, this man is full of knowledge and wisdom that you can take straight to the bank right here on The Career Musician Podcast. World travel. Traveler, you should be called Nomad, bro. <laughs> Richie uh, Pena. <laughs> I'm still not a you yet. One day, one day, one day. Ah, are you kidding me? Welcome <laughs> to the career musician, my brother. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, man. It's a pleasure to be here as always, man. Dude, so it's funny. I just said to you off off camera, I said, so so what's going on? And you were just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Flying right now is the biggest mess in the world. Dude, well, tell us about it because you just got back from. Well, you went from New York to uh -huh. Nashville. Yep. To Russia, to India. To, to India, then to Russia. Yep, and back. I mean, can I tell you, just in COVID uh, rapid test, like we spent over fifteen hundred dollars. Ridiculous. Fifteen hundred dollars in doing rapid tests, right? Because yep. to, to expedite it, they charge. Yep, is a hundred dollars per. And JFK, they had you at $250 per person to get on a plane, bro, to go overseas. Nuts. The paperwork, ridiculous. It was just like, I haven't, and, and you and I have traveled, you know, we've had some headaches. Right. Nothing like this. That is for sure. You know, overseas travel has been, yo, one of a kind now, for sure, one of a kind. Wow. Well, you know, uh, first of all, I think I thought this would be the perfect time to do your episode because you just got back from this big trip. Yes. Uh, you know, so. So. All right. So tell us a little bit. Let's just start there. So tell us what because I know what it is, but let's talk to the listeners. Yeah. Here. You know, tell us what was the impetus for this trip and and about the project that you're working on. Very exciting, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's most definitely a special project It's a project for my father, who's a, a jazz guitar player. And literally, you know, him, my uncles, they were all musicians, but none of them ever took it as a career. I was the first one in my family to take it as a career path. So, you know, uh, through I've been, you know, living their dreams, you know, or their dream through my eyes at the end of the day, you know. So my father decided that he wanted to kind of do this project. We had done one project before when I was like 15 years old and it was like a family band. And now, you know, many, many, many years later, <laughs> plus 20, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're back at it, man. And what became, you know, was supposed to be one or two songs, checking it out, see how it goes, became like a full project with horns and strings and, um, and a little bit of everything. So these are all songs that he's written, uh, you know, we arranged them together and uh, kind of producing them together. And everybody and their mother's been on it so far. So it's been been fun, including yourself. Uh, Kirk Whalen has played on a couple of things. Jeff Coffin, great saxophone player, has gone on a couple of things. Roy Agee, amazing horn player and arranger for Prince and for, for a thousand others, you know. Um, so it's been an amazing trip, you know. We started out, you know, a couple of musicians in my studio here, you know, came out to be a world project. even. Oscar Gattai is playing some bass on some and arranging some things. Um, yeah, it's kind of nuts. I got a little bit of everybody. Everyone was hearing the record. They were like, yo, we got to be part of this. <laughs> and it's been truly amazing, man. Truly, truly wow. amazing. That, that's um, awesome. I, like, I, like I told you from the beginning when you invited me to play on it, I, I was like, man, this what a special uh, project to yeah. do. You know, for for your parents. I mean, that's it's just it's it's amazing. So yeah, you you said it. Uh, uh -huh. Now I played rhythm guitar on mm -hmm. it because, by the way, because your dad is killing it, man. <laughs> I mean, I think every time someone hears them, they're surprised because I was I always say, yeah, it's a little project I'm doing with my father, and then when they hear them, they're like, wait, he can he can play. <laughs> no, he's a legit he's a legit musician. And yeah. the thing is, it's funny. I always know you. I've always known your dad as a businessman. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, yep. but never as a musician until now. So. Yeah, it was funny how he got into like a business program. He was, uh, he had me when he was uh, 18, you know, uh, went into school, you know, into college and he was studying music and he was a jazz head. 
And one of his instructors was like, man, you play great. He was like, I have this pop gig, you know, this kind of pop funk thing. And my father said, no, 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 I'm only playing jazz. And she told him, I have some advice for you. Pick another career. <laughs> she was like, if you only want to play jazz, you're never going to survive this. <laughs> That's, and mean, that's how he got into a business program. And like, he really thought about it. He spoke to her many times. He said, no, I want to do this. And she said, well, it's not that you can't. It's that you're going to have to actually, you know, be able to play everything to pay the rent. When it's for, when it's for a financial game, you're going to have to do it. If it's a personal game, he became a businessman and he did his own personal project, which is fun for him. But, uh, but that's how he got into a business program. Can you believe that? Wow, that isn't that is incredible. Yeah. And and let me just say, you know, the the uh, information that she gave him at that time is was not necessarily wrong at all. It was actually spot on, right? Yeah, it was the yeah. it was the, you know, late late 70s, uh, early 80s. You know, but now we see you know, we see players now who have made a whole career out of playing jazz. If you yeah. look at, you know, uh if you look at Kamasi Washington, yeah, and yeah. Brandon Coleman, who is our buddy, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's interesting, but I think that's the, the exception, not the rule, right? Yeah, yeah. But even with those guys, I mean, the cool thing is that they could play, a, you know, well, Kamasi, you know, played for Shaka Khan Keys and Sax forever, you know, until his thing picked up, you know. Brandon the same, from Alicia Keys to Babyface to whoever else to then. That's right. Um, I guess there's a little truth of it, but now that we're able to explore a lot more which is great you know back then there was a a formula right you had to go through a label there was no internet there was none of this stuff now you know you you make your own audience you know it's up to you whether you want them abroad here or if you want to just make videos all day there's an audience for that there's tons of things you know i mean that that phrase you just said that's the magic phrase you make your own audience that's it. that's you know yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of weight to that statement. Oh man, yeah. but 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 um, this experience has been kind of cool because, you know, we we've gone through our home recording studios, right? And you know, from here we've taken everything we've done here, uh, where I recorded the horns in in, uh, in Nashville, the new studio, Bunker Five, uh, by Edwin Portillo, amazing amazing studio, which. I have to send you some footage from there. Uh, beautiful studio. And it's crazy how I've gone from a homeroom to an official room to back to recording, everyone recording in our own little places. And then in, in, in Moscow, I ended up in this old school, like, like the gear itself, bro, is not even in existence. There's a tech every day who's coming in. Like you can't even bring water 20 feet from the room because <laughs> it's like that old, bro. And it sounded amazing, bro. This is a room that's been there since the USSR days, since the 70s. And, bro, sounds unbelievable. Like, wow. unbelievable. And you, you, know? you cut strings over there. Is that right? Yep. We, we cut a, a small chamber orchestra, you know, 30 people, and then recorded it two, three more times, like, to overdub it. And, bro, like, the sound was just, it blew my mind, you know? It totally, totally blew my mind. Wow. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. But it was awesome because at the same time, they were like, oh, man, where did you record, you know, the rhythm section? Sounds great. Where did you record the guitars? And I was like, well, that's my boy's studio. I did it at home. And they were like in awe. So it just goes to show, man, we could be anywhere. Thank God for like times like these that we can, you know, record from home, go to a big place, get whatever we need. Because, I mean, I thought about it. I was like, how would I even be able to record 30 people in this little room? Not even 10. <laughs> I can't even get 10 people in here. <laughs> that is, that is yeah. awesome. You know, I'm so glad you said that because right now is the perfect time because we are in the middle of getting ready to launch the Pro Series course, you know, yes. how to record pro level sessions from home in which you make a cameo ex uh, appearance for all of the drum recording. Yes. So, you know, it's perfect. And here's the thing. It's so funny because now we're in, you know, 2022 getting ready to hit. Yeah. And you and I have been recording from home. I'm going to oh. say for like 20 years already. You know? Yes, easily. <laughs> and it's so interesting because when you and I started, actually it was in the late 90s. Uh, mm. We were, you know, 
I guess we were some of the forerunners in that area, but everybody around us in Nashville was doing it too. You yeah. Know? So it's, it's, in other words, my point is it's really nothing new. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But to do it right, to make it sound professional as to where other musicians around the globe say to you, hey, where did you do that? That sounds really good. Where did you do this? Right. You know, that's the secret sauce, right? Yep, yep. And, and, and it's so true. I mean, you know, and especially with technology, we didn't have the technology in the early 2000s and late 90s mm -hmm. that we have now. I mean, yeah. right now, it's amazing the things we could do. You know, it was so right. funny. I had a friend who sent me a list of plugins that I had to look at for Black Friday, Cyber Monday. They were like, this is the crazy stuff. Like all this uh, AI stuff that you can, you know, get out there and we'll start EQing for you and looking at stuff. And I, you know, I just went on some videos and I was like, this is crazy. Like, you know, right now the technology is out there to just make great, great stuff. You know what I mean? So, you know, when you do that whole comparison, you know, we had to learn the basics, right? And I think that's what we did early on. Since there was no technology, you had to learn the basics for it like you had to learn where a microphone would go you know what's the best way to record your amp you know yeah. uh into at that time was probably you know one of the digital a tracks or the roland or one of those uh pieces and because of those basic things we've been able to now record so many years and with now with technology that we have now good lord i mean ain't, ain't nothing stopping you know right uh, well, it's so it's so interesting because back then and even now this holds true. You know, the great engineers tell you don't record with EQ, don't record with compression, you know, and mm -hmm. definitely don't record with any effects. You <laughs> yeah. know, they just tell you to get the cleanest sound and that still holds true, right? Yeah, if you can get clean sound into it, I mean everything else can happen inside of the machine. All your compression, all your EQ is just like just get the basics in, man. Just get it in, you right. know sounding great and 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 really you know uh with uh you know the courses that we put together that that's really the main goal is teaching you the basics you know right. um uh, of it you know it's like if you're gonna go you know be a barber they got basics for clippers and basics for you know scissors right. and you got to learn that before you can start making designs and doing everything else yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so you know, I, I think once people can learn that part, you know, and experiment from there, it's uh, it, it holds so true. I mean, you know, we've gone from now being able to make your own baffles. Uh, you know, you can find YouTube videos, which we didn't have before. We didn't understand the construction of a room, how it should sound. And now there's a thousand videos on it and you can get your room sounding great. And, you know, uh, going to Lowe's or going to Home Depot and grabbing some stuff and you know so the I, I feel like the advantages now not only in after you learn the basics but with the technology and and uh, all the information out there is something else man that's so true all right so there's there's so many things i want to ask you for our for our listeners uh, yeah. we, we have to start in in certain areas so uh since we're on this the home recording and the pro series course i, I want to start there um what can people expect from your uh, videos in the course? What what can they expect when you show us how you record drums? You know, what are some of the things that you mm -hmm. that you, you covered? Man, the cool thing about how uh, we, we planned out the video was that we started off with kind of going through the process, not only from recording, but also picking the gear, you know, that you have, making sure it's the right equipment, you're tuning it correctly before anything. So, you know, we took uh, three different songs with it, and we go from beginning to end through the process of recording it uh, to doing then some editing to processing out the EQs and reverbs. So it's a beginning to end video um, that but once you're done watching it, you can do it yourself the same exact way. Um, you know, we did it on Pro Tools, but you can do it on Logic. You can do it on Ableton. Um, it's all the same uh, kind of uh, features and process. It's just a different format of what you're using. But we go talking about the microphones, you know, uh, there's different ranges of microphones, you know, from inexpensive ones that get you decent sound to a little bit more expensive. And the reason why you're using those, you know, right. um, and as I was telling you, when I went to that Bunker 5, the Nashville studio, they had these pair of beautiful Coles microphones. Yeah. And I was like, man, these sound amazing. 
the price tag was also up there. <laughs> they used the coals for overheads. For right? overheads, yep, yeah, for the for the for the brass section for the horns. And oh, man, God. just that, you know, with the four guys playing, yeah. it was amazing. I mean, you know, um, so you know, and, and then he had some more inexpensive microphones right in front of them. You know, some uh, 421, some simple mics. So, yeah. you know, even through uh, on this video, we go through all the microphones that you you know possibly use starting from a $99, you know, mic set, you know, all the way to, you know, a thousand dollar mic set that you could be using, you know, right, right. Um, with it. And we go through each song talking about snare drums, the tuning, what was used. After we record it, then I show you the process of what's the EQ that I have on it, you know, what's the compression, why I'm using it. Um, then in that, we also talk about programming, you know, nowadays, a lot of drummers also need to learn how to program and be able to throw either shakers or loops or throw some trap loops behind what you're playing right. and from moving from that point. Uh, then from there, we go out to talking about how we mix it, how we export it, how we give it to a client, you know, kind of the do's and don'ts of, <laughs> of sending things, you know, so it's a, it's a miniature course on doing business and how to, and, you know, uh, giving you the real deal life examples of what you're going to get, you know, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of times when, you know, you read these things and you see these videos and they're not real life examples, you know, this is literally a track going from beginning to end. If there's a issue with the sound, you'll see me messing around with it. It's like, there's no, uh, there's no camera trickery or sound trickery. <laughs> this is all like raw going from beginning to end. And I kind of love that process because even for myself, we forget how much it takes you know, sometimes it becomes second nature to us and we're just running with all these different hats and we're just moving along. And, you know, while, while you're recording a part, you're editing, you move it to the side, you EQ it a little differently while you're, you know, and you, and it's to you, it becomes second nature because you've been recording guitars for so long. But when you have to explain everything that you're doing, you're like, wow, you know what? We really do a lot. <laughs> a lot. That's right. Yes. We're, we're, you're taking on the responsibility of, you know, at least, three to five jobs oh yes right for sure for sure you know uh even in the video we talk about when someone's sending you tracks you're also wearing the co-producer hat you know you're figuring out parts you're going to play you're figuring out tones you're figuring out different pieces they, they might you know give you an idea but at the same time you're you're the musician you're the co-producer you're the engineer <laughs> you're the editor and mixing because they want a kind of mixed version of just putting it on zero, you know, a unity gain. Mm -hmm. And what are all these guitars are going to sound like? Or what are all these drums are going to sound like without them having to do anything? So, yeah, right there, I just mentioned, I think, five or six things. Right, right. Well, let's just start right there. You said unity gain or, you know, faders up kind of a mix. Yes. If you don't give them a, a nice, clean faders up mix that they can reference immediately from their phone as an MP3, Yes. Then already you're losing because the client wants instant gratification, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. So at least because maybe they're driving or maybe they're on a, on a flight, but they can they can get Wi-Fi, they can download the MP3, but they can't download 32 wave files. That's right. You know? Yeah. They just want to hear a quick reference, you know, right? Yeah. And literally, if if that kind of Unity mix that you give them doesn't sound great, they think your part is not great, but it's not that. You know what I mean? Right. So like. You know, you're literally wearing all these different hats just to make sure that the client comes back and he's like, oh, I love it, you know? But yeah, you just had right. to master six things <laughs> right. to make the client happy, you know? And whether you're turning in files for Josh Groban or Tori Kelly, mm -hmm. or you're turning in files for a $250 demo, yep. right? Your process is the same. It doesn't change at all. At all, right. You know? Right. It really isn't. You know, the, the, the hard work that we put in one has to go into all because you'll never receive that second phone call if not. You know, so you got to make believe everybody's paying you a million dollars, you know, for that track. It's the track of your life, you know, and, you, and you're hoping that uh, next week they'll send you another one. <laughs> Which, by the way, you're not getting a million dollars, but no. you, have, you have to treat it as such. <laughs> no, man, that is so uh, true. Okay, okay. So yeah. let me ask you this. One of the things that I think detours drummers a lot of the time is the miking process. So mm -hmm. let, let's say you have an ace drummer who really knows how to set up their kit. 
They know how to get the best sounds possible in their room, but they've never mic'd up their drum kit on their own. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And let's say let's say now they're going to go shopping on Cyber Monday. Yep. And, <laughs> and, right. And buy a bundle, and they're going to make that their holiday project. Right. They're gonna, yes. They're going to set up their drum room. Yep. What's some advice you give them? You know. Well, man, it's so funny because you know during our whole pandemic and lockdown. I had many great drummers, like, I mean, killer drummers, you know, and, and we know a bunch of them, yeah. but uh, that just couldn't record themselves. They're great playing. They're always on tour or, or if not, they're even doing sessions, but they've never had to press record on their own. Right. And it was kind of crazy to, you know, speak to some of these guys. And I'm like, no, you guys should be doing a lot more, you know? Um, and what you just asked is the craziest thing. It's like, wow, but where do I start with all these microphones, all these inputs, all these, you know, a matter of fact, in the video, we start out with just uh, a two mic, you know, process, you know, a kick and an overhead, you know, just to show you what that sounds like, you know, because it doesn't mean you need to record every piece, you know, That's of right. your kit, you know, depending on what you're doing, you know, you can get away with a kick snare and two overheads, you know, uh, there's been a lot of great pop rock records that have been recorded that way. And on the video, we show you those examples where, you know, all of a sudden we have 13 mics open, but let me show you what three mics sound like. Let me show you what four mics sound like. Mm. And you'd be shocked that, you know, a lot of them are sound pretty cool. It sounds great. You get the vibe. You might not have as much detail, but some of those records and some of those genres don't need all that detail. You know, you don't need to mic up a ride cymbal if not needed, you know. Um, But really, there's some great uh, ways to start. You know, there's, there's two easy options. And one is the one that, that when I first started, I used was a SM57 on everything. You know, it's a $100 microphone you can buy and use for 60 bucks, 50 bucks. Um, and you can buy a gang of them. And you'll be shocked how great they sound. You know, uh, I've used them on kicks, snare, toms. Um, as a matter of fact, I've actually used one as a mono overhead and it's kind of been really, really cool. You know, wow. you get this kind of more grittier thing, but it sounds great. You know, so for less than 300 bucks, you have all these microphones, you know, if you're buying them used, you know, at $50. Right, which, which, by the way, are dynamic mics. They don't require any phantom power. Nope, no phantom you, power you at all. You can plug them into a little mixer, you know, or you can mm-hmm. plug them directly into your interface and, and be done. That's it. Yeah. And a matter of fact, there's even an a inexpensive Behringer, uh, a channel preamp slash, you know, interface for yeah. $99, $99. Wow. Like, I couldn't believe it. I, I had a friend show me one, and his uh, his interface, he had an Apollo, which is a very expensive interface. Right. Got jacked up. He had to send it out. A friend lent him one of these, and he was like, I love this thing. You know, it had these wow. Midas preamps because Midas and, and Behringer joined companies and forces together, that's and it was a $99 interface. That that's <laughs> That's he unfathomable. No, it is. It's yeah. really ridiculous. It's a USB uh, interface. Came in and sent me the files. And I was like, sounds good. I couldn't even, you know, I wouldn't even be able to tell. And I'm talking about not being able to tell in the music itself. You know, once you have bass and keys and the vocals on top of it, and it's just part of the mix of everything, you you couldn't tell if it was recorded on an Eve or anything else at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, $99 interface. You know, a couple hundred bucks worth of uh, SF57s, and you'd be amazed where you can start, you know. Wow. Um, There's something else. And, you know, then you can go a level up from there. You know, Audix makes like a little set for 600 bucks. I was just going to say, the Audix are good, right? Yeah. Yeah, They're great, you know. Can't go wrong with it. Great kick drum mic, great uh, little overhead. They have a snare also. And then, you know, instead of buying a $99 one, you can get a Focusrite Scarlet. It costs 200 bucks, 250 right. and still get the eight channels. And, like, there is technology out there that, that will shock you, man. Right. You know? Um, so uh, all, any of you drummers, I say start on that mid-level. And if you really are starting and not sure if you want to do this, then start on the low level, the SM57. But get yourself, you know, an Audix set and a Scarlet preamp with eight channels and, you could be recording records tomorrow, you know? That's that's it. And worst case scenario, let's just say you despise the process. You buy yep. the gear, you try it. You you know, I would say give it at least a couple weeks before you turn your back on yes. it. If after a couple weeks you're just not feeling it, turn around and sell the gear, right? Yep. Just, you can you know. sell it and, and someone will be buying it. Yeah. 
exactly. you know yeah. uh, there's tons of people always looking for used microphones and used interfaces after done and let's say you lost a couple hundred bucks well that's it you lost a couple hundred bucks you tried it if it's for you or not but um i think once any musician does and they start getting used to the process they enjoy it you know i agree, um, I agree. It, there's nothing like being together with some guys recording but you know there's nothing also like being in your house and just hitting record and 15 minutes having a drum track and sending it to someone i mean come on man and the thing yeah is- without having to set up a kit again <laughs> I mean, we got tons of junk to set up. <laughs> right, exactly. And we've been doing this, like we said, for decades. You know, sometimes, man, you you press send on that we transfer or that Dropbox mm-hmm. file. You know, you send the files out, and you know, instantly on your on your Venmo or PayPal, you That's get right. thousands of dollars of payment. Like, I mean, yes. it's, it's like, whoa! I I just made money. You could really do this you from know? home. You yeah. know, right. And the crazy thing is, you know, for drummers, uh, I know that, that they're always like, oh, we need the space. We need this. Man, I've watched so many guys record drums in closets and yeah. in little rooms. And, wow, you know, we, we most drummers already have like a little mini practice room somewhere. You know, all you're doing is now taking a laptop and putting some mics on it and you're done. It's it's not changing much, you know. All right. Let's talk. You just you just said something important, though. Let's, because you have your studio set up ideally. It, you, you've been doing this for a while. You, you yes. know, you've worked your way up to it. But what's the easiest way for a drummer who's just starting to set up the computer? Because you don't want the computer and the interface to be jostled around. Yeah, right? you can't. It can't be getting all uh, you know shaky from the movement. So, what's mm-hmm. the easiest way to do that that you found? Well, I think right now a lot of drummers have had to have either like some laptops or something always on stage. And, you know, just a small table, you know, that you even, or even a drum case, you put a drum case to the left, yeah. or you can put your sticks and you can put your laptop on it. And that's all you really need, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it's amazing. We've been using cases for everything, you know? Uh, uh, it, it's the extra stand when you need it, you know, for whatever it is. Um, easiest way is just put your laptop in a, as a small interface on the drum case, or if you have a little side table that, you know, um, even one of the funniest things that I still have from the days you and I used to record is one of those uh, table trays, you know, the eating table trays, the little <laughs> snack tables. Yes, yes. that's it. <laughs> I was just going to say, you've been using the snack table since I know you. <laughs> yep. And I still have those all over the room. They're cheap. Yeah. You can hold them, put yep. them away. You can buy them at Target or anywhere for 25 bucks for a set of four, you know, yep. Yep. and that is the best little table, you know, yep. um, and, and yeah, you just put that, you know, we're normally to your left. Uh, I know, you know, for our practice kits and a lot of drummers use a side snare drum. Um, just remove that side snare drum. You know, we don't need it for the session. You know, it's not like we're trying to uh, duplicate, you know, a, a whole session or a whole live show where, where you need three or four snare drums, you know, just use the one you need. Remove that side snare drum, which 90% of the drummers use. Yeah. And that's where you put your laptop at, you know, and it's an easy setup. You know, um, if your lefty is always to your left, I mean, if your righty is always to your left, your lefty is always to your right. Yeah. Um, and it's super convenient, you know. Um, it's safe, far away, but close enough for you to hit record and play. Right, right. Now, something else I want to talk about is setting up overheads because a lot of people don't realize that when you put these mics up, on these big boom stands, they get top mm-hmm. heavy and they can literally go this, you know. Oh, yes. I know you've learned that lesson the hard way. Sure. <laughs> I most definitely have. <laughs> no. no, you know, what's, what's great is uh, we all have our gym bags, right? I was going to say that. Yeah, we all have a bunch of gym bags that we've used or bags that we've used on the road or whatever. And, you know, when you're putting those boom mics up in the air, just throw a bag on them. You know, it's like there's all these home remedies that we have, you know, that, right. that we could just use. Um, and we, we have gym bags full of junk from everywhere. I got little sports one. I got my son's baseball ones that, you know, he don't use anymore. Yes. And, you know, I could just throw that on top of it, but there's so many ways. Yeah. And, and you'd be surprised now, um, with all these microphone sets, these mics are becoming small and smaller. They're more convenient because they're, they're trying to make sure that, you know, there's easy setup for drummers. Right. Now, sometimes you can't even see these bikes. They got clips for everything, you know? That's so right. you're just on. clipping along, and you, you probably just have one or two stands max. Um, but they have all these clip-ons that you could just now put on drums, and 
easy setup, man. They, and that's they, what you they, use. You use the clips that go on the rings, right? Yep, on the rims. Yep, it makes yep. life a lot easier. Wow. Little stands. I have a couple stands here and there. What's funny is I, I've gone a, a little crazy now. I even have these uh, uh, these kind of stands that I drilled up to the ceiling. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. there's no. <laughs> Yeah, that's you know, I'm not running because I have a very small room. So before I was running into things all over the place. Um, so I had another drummer friend and he was saying, man, I found this little five dollar gadget that, you know, you can uh, drill into your, the different ceilings and you just screw in a, a, a stand from there like you would normally do. And uh, th there's great stuff now. He, uh, Amazon is a drummer's best friend. You know, <laughs> yeah. there's everything on there that we can use. That's, that's but yeah, with these new microphones, they're so small. They already have clips on them that you can use that, you know, even the old school way of, of, of big, you know, overhead mics falling on top of us, even those weigh so little bit. They weigh less than a couple pounds, you know, for a microphone now. It sounds great, you know. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's something else. I love that. Now, all right, I want to talk about something else from a producer standpoint. Remember, Richie and I were sitting here saying that, you know, when we do these jobs at home, we're, we're taking on the work of many different roles. From a production standpoint, me and Richie calls me, he's funny, you, you call me an old man because sometimes I hate too many crash cymbals. If I yeah. hear too many crash cymbals, I just want to take the drums and throw them out the window. I'm like, don't give me all those damn crash Now, And actually, it's the, it depends on the style of music you're producing because if you listen to Jack White, sometimes there's not one crash symbol in the yep. whole song. Yep, yep. You know? mm -hmm. Same thing if you listen to some old funk and R&B albums, sometimes there's hardly any crashes, right? Ah, just the downbeat. You know, versus if you're listening to some rock stuff, there's a crash on every other beat or some gospel yeah. stuff. Uh -huh. It's just yep. nothing but crash symbols, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Accents everywhere. <laughs> so, so talk about the production uh uh, process of recording different drums separately. Yeah, and you know what? That is um, even in, in the video that we, that we were, that we put together. That was really one of the main focuses because yeah. Yeah. you can have you know you can be recording a, a funk tune right, and, and if you have you know a twenty four inch ride going through or a crash, it's not going to work. You know what I mean? Like gear choice is really really important. And that comes from not only choosing the gear, but also production and understanding the music that you're playing at the end, right. you know, and that process takes a lot. You know, I also think that's why you and I always say it's, it's very important to listen to a lot of music. You got to know a little bit of everything that's going on, you know, stylistically, someone sends you something you're like, oh, I know what that is. You know, you can reference it quickly to something. And that plays a very, very big part. Even, uh, um, you know, the snare that I'm choosing. You know, it, it, it has to be the right snare for the part. You know, if it's a, a jazz piece or if it's a, a rock piece or a funk piece, like all of those tunings are different. It can even be the same drum, but the tuning is different. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not telling you to go get 100 snare drums. You know, you can get two, three snare drums that you can tune up and down. But that piece is really, really important. You know, anything that is being sent to you, they're expecting you to understand it, right, knowledge-wise. They're expecting you to get that tone to back to them. And, and that's part of the entire process, you know. Um, you don't want them to be telling you, you know, what drum to use, what cymbal to use, how to tune it. That's all on you. And that's on your musical knowledge. And that's all on your, you know, musical investment that you've made, you know, studying all these different music, you know, um, knowing, you know, stylistically how to play. But the drum really most definitely plays a big part of it, or how you're choosing, what you're tuning, and that tuning aspect comes with the production aspect altogether. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Now, how, how how common is it for you to just play a kick, hat, and snare pass, and then do another pass with toms, and then maybe another pass with cymbals? Man, um, I've only been asked that a couple times in my life, you know? Um, that was the 80s way of recording. A lot of the, the big rock stuff in the 80s because yeah. they didn't want the bleed. They used to record kick and snare together. Yep. They, they used to record hi-hat together, then all the fills afterwards. Yeah. And you'd be surprised. Now, as dumb as this sounds, they are drum overdubs. <laughs> right, 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 right. You know what I mean? Like, who would imagine there would be a drum overdub? But yeah, I've taken, you know, some passes. 
of just playing regular and then there might be a section of the song where there's extra toms that you need to record and crashes and swells so i'll give them a whole channel you know another eight channels or whatever of toms and swells and anything else right. um but most of the time is is together but there is a lot of like the especially pop rock stuff where there's a lot of overdub of toms or the tom is actually making its own drum groove that they're gonna loop and chop up and put with the kit later on you know so they become little ideas or i might just play a groove with with a tom and snare you know make my own loop to put on top of what i'm playing right. you know so it, it 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 is like you know i i, I people laugh but uh there are drum overdubs that are sometimes required. <laughs> right. But again, this is all up to your ears as the drummer and the yes. drum producer. Right. Yep. You know, you're yep. producing the drums of the song for the client. For the client. Yep. You want to give them a final. It's like if they only had guitars, keys and bass, you have to provide that whole bed, whether it be right. sometimes there's pieces of a song where you want some motion and it's not going to be a drum part. It can be a loop type thing. You might be chopping up some sticks that you clack together, or you might be putting a tambourine hit with some verb that just you reverse and you make it sound like something else. It's not yes. even what it is, but you're building this whole bed that you want that all they need to do is put all these channels up, unmute them, and you have this whole big rhythm section for them. Yeah. Well, and that's what I love about getting files from you. Anytime, I mean, we've been working together for years. You always send me the same thing. It's so consistent. I can count on it. Like I can, mm. you know, watch, like you can count it on the clock. Yeah. The clock. It's like, so as long as I load it in bar one, beat one, place it right on the grid. And usually it's somewhere between, wouldn't you say 10 to 16 channels that you give yep. me? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. and I don't have to do anything. I don't have to uh, solo them up or pan them or, or adjust the levels. I just hit play and it's like a premix. Yes. Drums, yes. Right? Yes. Yep. And I mean, that, I that's even, a fine art. It is. But you know what? The more you hear it and the more you give it that way, um, you kind of give a vision. Like even reverbs, I print reverbs out separately. That's right. So that way, if you want more reverb, what you got to do is just raise the reverb, but I give it to you the way I hear it. You know, this is the amount of reverb I think. This is the kind of reverb you should use. Um, it's been funny. I, uh, even in Moscow now, when I was there, I had recorded some drums prior to getting there for a guy, and he was super, super picky. And he was amazed that at the end of the mix that he ended up just using what I had and nothing else. That's right. And he was like, that's a first, you know? So I gave him reverbs. I gave him everything else around it. And all he did was mix it in with his tracks. And he was like, you know, it, it, it completely worked. And I say 90% of the time, um, engineers and mix engineers end up using the reverbs that I give. Because I'm trying to give a whole picture, you know, uh, uh, to the artist, to the engineer, or whoever it is. And that, that plays a role. So not only have your drums, you have your drum overdubs, you have your effects, you have your little program um, uh, items. And literally, the more you get someone accustomed to that, the more they want to come back to you. You know, right. uh, you, you're giving, you're helping them with the vision. They know that you don't have to think about it at the end. Yeah, I love that. And speaking of which, let's talk about uh, drum samples and and replacement yeah. and triggers and such. I know when we're playing, when we're playing live using triggers is a big thing right you guys are mm -hmm. oftentimes triggering things but in the studio it's 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 not so much triggers but a lot of times it's sample replacement right yes yep 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 there's a couple different ways of doing it you know rolling uh since you know a lot of the guys you know live use rolling gear they have these great triggers that you can just from your you know spdx or your pad you can just record those and i've had i have a setup that you know when i do go live um, I'm also recording kicks and snares separately, whether it be, you know, on these pads, I have like the pop rock type stuff. I have the R&B type stuff just to give extra. And those samples, I can either use them here or in the studio with, you know, something like Trigger um, or, you know, or Slate has their own uh, system. Uh, you can use some great kicks and snares and you'll be shocked that just adding a little bit of a sampled kick or a little bit of a sampled uh, snare will take your whole sound to another level, you know? It makes it sound like the big leagues, right? It yes, like, it, it most elevates. definitely does, yeah. you know? 
And, you know, those, these are guys who've taken these drums and they, you know, probably mic'd it with 10 different mics, you know, from room to close to side to every angle. They have the bottom mic perfectly aligned in phase. And, you know, these are some professionals who have, have mastered this craft uh, of sampling drums. And just that little bit on top of your sound goes a long way. I've never done the whole you know, uh, sampling of toms, but I know guys who do, and they do a great job of it, you know? Um, but like everything is like added, you know? Um, there's some great companies out there, you know, uh, who, who have these sounds and literally a, a little goes a long way. It's like salt and pepper, you know? Uh, little goes a long way. You don't need the whole... <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. A little bit. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that because with guitars, it's the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times people think, you know, for rock stuff, you need tons of gain and distortion. Yeah. But actually it has it has the opposite effect. If you use too much distortion and you start stacking those tracks, it just sounds horrible. Yep, yep. You know, if you think about any, like, take, for instance, a, a classic rock band, which now is classic rock, but like yeah. Guns N' Roses, right? Yeah. Guns, it's not really classic rock, but it's classic 90s rock, right? Yes. You know, if you take Slash's rhythm sound, it sounds crunchy, but it doesn't have a ton of distortion on it. Mm -hmm. You know, because once you start stacking it and stacking it, then it just becomes too much noise, right? Yeah, man. It's the gotta, overkill. Right. And then also, if you listen to bands like uh, Animals as Leaders or Periphery, right? Mm -hmm. Those guys are using heavy, like hard rock, gent, you know, metal sound. Yeah. But again, their gain is not on 10. No, no, no. You know? and, and those are the perfect guys who actually use the trigger stuff really, really well. And that's what I was going to say, because the yes. drummers, yes. Those drummers they are triggering like crazy. Very, very well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so and talk it's about a that. Specific tone and a specific genre and and the quickness of it is really hard to to match on a live kit with the phasing and that's why they use a lot of triggers right. on it. Right. And and you know what? And that goes really back to what we're talking about like what is it genre specific that you need, you know? Yeah. Uh it's not like you're not going to go to an old school uh you know uh hip hop thing or old school uh R&B and then use these triggered sample metal kicks and snares <laughs> it's it's not not work. <laughs> and, and that's and it's so funny because i wanted to bring this up too the way you and i met was not as guitar player and drummer we yep. met as writers slash producers yeah that yep. like that was the auspice of, of which which we created our first you know working environment back in nashville mm -hmm. uh, and, and something that's really interesting is because you and i always connected on that level is that we take it so seriously each genre we want to get as authentic as possible yes right yes and and, and to do that there's so much minutia there's so many nuances mm -hmm. yeah how because i know how i developed it but you know how did you develop i mean really we developed it over the years just by listening and really yes right a lot of listening trial and never yes. you know it's like any musician we all start out with like a certain genre that attracts us and we go full ham on it, you know, right. and we just kind of develop. But as time goes on, you know, you, you just start listening to a little bit of everything because not only is that expected. Of, I mean, there's no musician today that that is expected only to play one style, one thing stylistically. There's not even a gig, you know, right. you, you talk about any pop gig right now, uh, you know, from a Justin Bieber to Ariana Grande to whatever. You'll yeah. start out with like you know, a crazy 80s, you know, flashback type thing. And then all of a sudden some more R&B thing uh, or a trap thing where it's just like the show itself, the Katy Perry show goes from one extreme to another. Like any of those artists that I've just mentioned, like you're literally playing stylistically, you know, all over the place. You That's know, right. you, we're expected to do that. I, I can't think of a musician uh, who quote unquote is doing the whole man out. I'm only uh, uh, I'm only uh, legit to my to my genre. I'm only you know committed. I'm only going to be playing you know what I love. There's very few guys who could do that. You know, yeah. uh, you know those who have those careers. But right. any one of us, I mean, you know, when when we first got together in Nashville, we went from a, a Latin thing going to a CCM thing to a gospel thing the next day. It was like 
it, you didn't know what you were going to hit, you know? And then um, indie rock, you know? And yep, yeah, a yeah. lot of that stuff. And then to some of the country stuff they got was more modern. Some was a lot, all some was older. Yeah. Um, like it was a range of everything. And no, we ain't going to just listen to that stuff every day by because of we like it. <laughs> But we have to know it, you know what I mean? It's like, right. it's part of our, our DNA of music, why we know, you know? Um, you know, uh, uh, we have some great friends who, uh, DeMarco Johnson is actually a perfect great. example of this. Great. He yeah. is like a, a, like a radio, you know? You, <laughs> you, you'll just, you know, you, you play a song, you talk about something, he'll be like, oh yeah, I know that one. And, and he'll start just playing it. You'll be like, wow, that sounds like it. Like he That's understands like it. it. You know, and it's like there's very few guys who, you know, who can do that. But that's what we need to be able to do to to kind of make it through all this different music. You know, right. um, as a producer, yeah, there's guys who have a niche in one area and that's great. Um, but you and I have gone from every genre to TV and film to licensing music yeah. to back and forth. You know, yeah. um, you've worked on many movies. If you didn't have the, that experience, you wouldn't even be able to work on those things, you know. Right. Um, if you didn't understand the music, you know, right. um, it's so crazy. You know, uh, the other day I opened up right before leaving uh, to this long trip. I had like six songs to do and they none of them were in their own genre at all. I started with some crazy like rock metal type thing. The next one was a Christmas song, which made <laughs> just a straight up old school Christmas song yeah. that they were trying to get out, you know, before the end. I did a couple CCM stuff. Uh, I did uh, one gospel, and then I ended up doing a reggaeton track for someone, you know, where they wanted to add some live drums to it, you know, and like from each song, you know, even you know, with, with my my kids, you know, they always come down and sometimes listen, and they're like, "What you doing now?" You know, it's like, but it's ever changing, you know what I mean? And we have to be able to do that, you know, and it makes our jobs more interesting. I mean. You know, I'm sure for yourself, you listen to something new, you pick up a different guitar that will make you play differently, do something else. The same thing with drums. You know, you pick up a different cymbal or you set up your drum set according to what kind of the mu music is stylistically. And it makes you play that way. You know, uh, you know, if, if I'm doing this, you know, pop rock thing, I'll set up, you know, a, a floor time, a 12 inch, you know, just a four piece with two cymbals. And it makes me think differently. It makes you play differently. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm doing something bigger. You know, I'm setting up an 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. I'm setting up a big drum set with different effects, symbols, and that's going to make me play differently, you know? That's um, right. I remember so. last year, actually, you played on a, one of our Christmas songs. Uh -huh. Remember that? And I told you, I said, hey, man, I'm going for like this really retro indie rock uh, or rockabilly. It was like Rock retro Rock rockabilly. <laughs> yeah. sound. Remember that? Yep. And, and, you know, you took you took a couple passes at it with different yes. instruments. With different yep. kids. yeah and then that and that sometimes hey at the end of the day it, it might take that you know, a couple different ways to get it to right. where you want it to sound and, and what you want it to do but you need to switch out the gear play a little differently eq a little differently you know go to taste and um you know even mics i think i told mics. you yeah i was saying hey use less mics you don't have to use so yes much, right yeah. i think what we ended up with on that one was probably like four or five mics yeah, exactly. The original session had 13. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, no, and, and that's what it, it, I mean, it, it really, it goes back to kind of understanding the process of music and understanding the evolution of music, you know. Right. Um, I, I think uh, going back and reading how some of these records were recorded, you know, think of any genre whether it be the Motown stuff, right? Uh, mm. If you think of anything like your Earth, Wind & Fire type stuff, right? You can go and see how some of those records were recorded. You can see some of the gear. You can go back. You can see what what made that sound. And you can, you can go back to a Beatles record, you know? Uh, Guns N' Roses record. You know, you can just go from all of these different things and you read up, you know, what was used. And, and not that you say you have to get that, but there's a technique that was used for it, you know? Um, you can see that there was a certain uh instrument used for a certain mic position and you know it, i think we're in a, a great we're in a great society of google we could google anything we want in this world you know i was like there's no reason why anybody should be asking man i don't know no look it up it takes two minutes 
<laughs> you'll find out in a couple minutes, you know, maybe it might take 10 pages to look through, but oh, right, right, right. You can, you can figure it out in 20 minutes or so, you know, there's yeah, and no oftentimes ex- less. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. So it's like, you can find anything, you know, it's the craziest thing, you know? Um, that is so true, man. Yeah. So, you, you know, I, I think with, with all of, you know, that we've talked about music and production, you know, there, there is some type of research that if you love music, you would do just because of enjoyment, you know, mm-hmm. and um, it, it kind of brings the love back, you know, for it, you know, it's like, oh, man, that's interesting. This is how they did this. You know, this is how they recorded this, you know, or um, going back and forth. I mean, you know, I, I started out, I was telling someone recently that I, I started out, you know, as a 15 year old drummer who got stuck in the studio because I was the young kid. Someone had to drive me at the end. So while I was there, I was picking up, learning how to work a two-inch machine. You know, they had their their first, you know, SP-1200, you know, that's when the hip-hop was still hitting real hard. And I learned how to use a machine because I was just there. There was just so much knowledge, you know what I mean, in this time. And because I loved it, I wanted to learn those things, you know. Right. We have a love for music, and I know that we can sit on YouTube all day scrolling, you know, thousand guitar players, thousand drummers. Uh, sometimes it's good to just get a, a little bit more knowledge on how the back end, how things work, you know. Um, get, you know, just research into something else just a little bit more, man, you know. Even the history of how records were made or how bands came about, like even that is inspiring, you know. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I was mean, stuck. Oh, go ahead. In, in, I was stuck in India and there was no American TV and Netflix happened to work and I watched this whole documentary on the band Chicago and I loved it. It was amazing. Yeah. You know, they, they went through kind of their process, how they had their studio, how they became a band. And it actually inspired me to try different things. When I came home, I got a, a couple of things that I have to record. And I was like, I'm just going to try that for the heck of it. You know, it's just something that I got out of nothing, you know, yeah. uh, just by, you know, putting a little time and checking something else out. That's brilliant. I love watching the documentaries on other artists and bands and producers. I especially love seeing behind the scenes in the studio, how they created certain things. And then, like you said, come in here and try try to recreate it yourself. Yeah. Now, that being said, we are fortunate because although we may not have the original analog gear, we have all of the plugins and all mm-hmm. of the software that emulates it. Um, yes. Which I was going to bring up, too, because what do you say to the drummer that says, oh, it's easy for you to say, Richie, because, you know, you have all the Neves and you have the tube techs and you have the distressors, all this great outboard gear. But what about me? I don't have any of that. And again, that's no excuse. No, no excuse. Matter of fact, I did something for a couple of friends. There's a drummer in Houston, great, great friend of mine, Hennessy's. And he was one of those drummers who was just an unbelievable drummer, but didn't have anything. He bought a small interface. And what I did was uh, he bought Logic, which uh, if, if I had to recommend anyone to start, Logic and the Mac, you can't go wrong. 200 bucks. I mean, 200 bucks. You got yeah. the world at your fingertips. And, I mean, and you, Apple will pre-install it for you. Yes. You don't <laughs> have to worry about nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and... Logic works with every interface in the world. It's like everything has to, you know, come through the, the Apple world at some point, you know? Yeah. Um, but what I did, he really had just an eight channel preset. And I made a template for him um, on Logic, all using just stock plugins, nothing wow. extra, nothing out of his pocket. And when I, when, when I actually processed his clean sounds, I was like, this sounds really good. Like, yeah. I was even shocked because even for us, we're like, oh, man, this guy just told me about this plugin. I got to spend a couple hundred bucks now invest into this. This is going to make my life easier. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes simplicity is the best thing in the world. Just learn the couple things you have. Use it to the, to the end. I mean, if I had to start today, I'll be honest with you. I would just have a simple interface, some simple mics, and a laptop. You know, all this that we've acquired over the years, yes, it's been awesome, but it's because the technology was not there as it is now. You know, and forget it. Now, I mean, what my boys recorded in Houston with the template, he's he's doing sessions for everyone. And he's sending it out, and he's like, you know, he'll he'll send me some money on the side, but like, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> from his session 
<laughs> it was like, because it wouldn't be possible, you know? But even in our video, I, I'm, the things that I did could be done on a Logic, you know, stock plugin. I'm just explaining to you kind of, you know, how to scoop out some of the mids on some of these toms, uh, you know, uh, you know what, what attack is good for, you know, the high end on the snare or kick drum to kind of come through, but you can use any cue that, that's on it. So literally he has this on Logic uh, interface, simple mics. As a matter of fact, he started out with uh, 87s. He didn't even go the, cause he wasn't sure if he was even gonna like it. And now he's like, I'm just gonna leave it like this cause everything's working. I'm not even gonna bother with it. At some point, if I have to upgrade, then I'll do it down the line. But He's the perfect example of there is no excuse. So he, start, he started with SM57s, you mean? Or? Yeah, that's what he's still yeah. using. Yeah, right now. Wow. And, it, and it, yeah. I, we did this probably a year ago. And now he's just doing sessions out of his house now in his garage. You know, he didn't treat it. He didn't do nothing. It's just has it open, recorded, and it sounds good. You know, it's yeah, like, you know, a lot of these drummers, you know, uh, 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 you know, for you guys listening, a lot of you guys already have the talent. You know, it's in your fingertips already. Yeah. You already got it. You know what I mean? It's different if, if we were beginners trying to learn an instrument, then also trying to learn how to record our instrument. You know what I mean? It's like a, a lot of us listening already and a lot of us playing have, you know, quote unquote, mastered our craft. We can play. Right. You know, so it's like, you know, uh, you, you have the instrument, you already know how to make it sound good by yourself. All you're doing now is amplification, recording it at the end of the day. That's it. I love, I love that paradigm you just laid out, man. That's it. You, you have the skill set already. Now yep. you're amplifying it. You're, you're, you're that is it. it and it's done. That's done. It. Done. You know, you're not learning how to hit a snare drum or how to hit a hi-hat perfectly in yeah. time or level out. You already got that, that, that skill. You already have that skill. You're beyond that. already. You right. know? Um, so here's a guy who just bought an interface and a laptop and already doing sessions from his house for the last year. You gotta love that, man, and and that is that thanks to the technology and and the times yeah. that we live in, you know. All right, so so I want to switch gears real quick, going back to where we started. You know, you are a globe trotter. You've been traveling the globe, uh, you know, forever, and you and I have traveled the globe extensively together. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'll never forget when I called you up uh, back. I want to say it was in two thousand nine, early two thousand nine, I think. Yep, it was two thousand nine. And I said, "Hey, Richie, I can't guarantee it. I, I want you to. I want, and this, this the, the point of this story is to you know talk about the <laughs> business, how to how to be a, a music business person, a career musician with business sense. Yes. I said, "Hey, I want you to fly yourself out to L.A. I I can't pay for your ticket. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can't even put you up at my place because <laughs> I was going through some crazy stuff at the time. I was like, I don't have anywhere for you to stay. You got to put yourself up." And I want you to, but I want you to come and audition for this gig, but I can't guarantee that you're going to get the gig. <laughs> yep. 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 <laughs> and you were like, I'm in, you I'm know, in. tell me when. And it turns out you, you did all that. You flew yourself out. You got a hotel, you came and auditioned and you got the gig. And that was with Babyface. Yep. And then you had the gig, I think for what, nine years, eight, nine years. Yeah, We did like eight, nine years together. It was awesome, yeah. man. Great, great, great. You know, I love that, you know, you, you became the, the MD and uh, you were kind of spreading out the wings of trying different people from everywhere. You know, right. you wasn't just L.A. based. You know, you had people in Nashville, you had some people in New York, you had some people from everywhere. And um, it was funny because during that time, I was already, you know, you and I had already been producing a lot, you know, right. and we were already producing for other people. We were also, you know, I was at that time with Natalie Grant. We're doing, you know, close to 100 between her and some other gigs, you know, anywhere from 100 to 125 dates a year. So it wasn't like it was, you know, everything was good, you know, in the sense. But, um, you know, to, to at least have the time to, you know, be with you, try something new, you know, in, in the business world and in the music world, I, I, I equate them equally in the sense of you put in what you get what you put in at the end of the day. Because uh, as an entrepreneur, if you don't work, you don't get paid. I don't care what it is. You know what I mean? It's it's uh, it, even if you're in real estate, right? You still got to go out there, look for the places, buy the places. You got to furnish place. You got to make sure everything's up to code. You'll be fixing something. You're still putting into it, right? Yeah, you get in income from it, but there's still the amount that you put in 
is what you're going to get back in return, right? Your efforts, right? Your, your efforts come back in full. And with music is the same, you know? Um, you and I have had friends be like, yo, recommend me for a gig. And I was like, I would gladly recommend you for a gig if you have some work ethic. <laughs> if you like, if you could, like, if you could, you know, show up on time, know how to write an email, like know how to complete sentence, like just, you know, just, just be able to talk. Yeah. Communicate with management. Yes, like, exactly. <laughs> communicate with the artist without trying to be their best friend. You know, yep, yep. The last mm -hmm. thing you do is go buddy up with the artist, and then all of a sudden, the artist decides that they don't need you anymore. Oh, now you're screwed. You know. That's it. Yep. No, show up on a bus on time. You yeah. know, we've had all oh. of those things. You know, it's just it, it's sometimes the simplistic thing. You know, yeah. uh, you and I have a lot of great friends who are, I think, super talented, and unfortunately, that work ethic hasn't given them that opportunity. Right. You know. Right. Um, man, this is a business, you know, we're, we're musicians at heart and we love it and, and we're able to make a career out of it, but only because we look at it as a business. We have to be smart about it. You know, uh, um, someone the other day asked me about endorsements. Oh man, I want to get endorsed for this. I want to get endorsed for this. I was like, an endorsement is a business. Like, what are you doing for them? And what is that company doing for you? You and I have endorsements not just because of who we play with or our talent is because we're also on social media. We're also doing other things. We're also doing, you know, shows or we're also, you know, or, or at a NAM, you're playing, you're, you're doing something. It's a right. business acquisition. They're investing into you. And my Lord, I, I think half of what we do for music or even 75% of what we do for music is, is the business side of it. You know, writing emails, sending out invoices, being able to catch up, having lunch meetings with people that you're trying to encounter. You know, I mean, think about when we first met in Nashville, right? It was uh, uh, a and R guy that we both that we were both producing for, and he was like, "Man, I think you guys would actually work better together than separate." And that's how was, that, was it. Lynn, Lynn Nichols, Nichols? Lynn, yep, Nichols. Lynn Nichols, good old Lynn, man. Lynn was awesome, bro. Man, shout out to you Lynn know? Nichols in Nashville. Yes, yeah. man. Lynn yeah. was. Uh, I remember going into. Lynn's office and, and showing him some stuff. He was like, I have an artist and I like this, but I think I want you to work with this person. And I think he'll fulfill out the rest of the vision. And it was you and, you know, me, you and Ziggy. Ziggy uh, Diaz. That's how the great Ziggy Diaz, that's how we all came about. But like, you know, if, if we didn't take those meetings or know how to sit with a person in an office to present our music, to talk vision, to talk budget, how many times, you know, not only when you're producing a record, you know, they're giving you a certain amount of money and you have to make that money go. Right. It has to survive. You're an accountant at that point. You're not a musician or producer anymore at that point. Right. You're an accountant. You're saying, okay, here's my budget. I got to pay this guy. I got to pay this guy, but I also have to make enough money for us because we're producing it. We're putting most of the time into it. You just became an accountant with a spreadsheet. <laughs> You just became an account. Congratulations. Congratulations. Here's the budget. Now you're an account. And how many times have we worked with other producers who mm -hmm. screwed the hell out of that budget? Oh my lord, yes. I mean, and then we had to be on then we had to be our own collection agency. Collection agency at that point. You <laughs> yeah, know? Like, you know, hello, Penaman Collections, you know. Yes. <laughs> right. wow. No, it was bad. You you had guys. Matter of fact, you have guys who their production career has ended because they would take one thing, pay or blow all the money out. Then they had to take another production gig to finish off the first one. first one. They couldn't finish off the next record, you know, and it just kept on. And by the time that catches up to you, it's like, yeah, you're talented, but you can't control your budget. So we can't even hire you. It's like it doesn't matter how talented you are, you know, and that goes back to also musician. Man, I don't care if you're the greatest keyboard player, drummer, bass player, guitarist. If you can't show up to your flight and you miss a flight every time, come on. You know, it's with, like... I mean, with, with the technology today, with all the apps that we have and the yep. reminders and the notes and the <laughs> all the digital settings, there's no reason why anybody should miss a flight. I mean, you know... I, I can't even fathom the idea of missing a flight unless nope. it's unless it's like some kind of you know God. Thank you. Yep, exactly. Right, right, you know, accident, right. something. That's uh, different. But you know, to say that you didn't wake up in time, or to yeah. say that you didn't schedule enough time for your Uber to get to the airport. Come exactly. On. We already know that. 
And man, I, I it, it's it's so I tell all the young musicians, I said, man, you're gonna be great one day when you learn to grow up. I, I in my town right now, I'm in, in Pennsylvania. For those of you who don't know, I'm I'm a New Yorker always. Yeah. But I live in, in Allentown, Pennsylvania now, yeah. 40 minutes from Philly, uh, maybe an hour, 45 minutes from New York. Um, there's some amazing young kids. And I wish I could recommend it for something. When I say young, to me, they're young. Just from saying they're 22, 23. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're going to be beasts. They're going to be amazing. But there's no way I could recommend them because they're not mature enough to get on a flight on time, yeah. to have a proper dress code or even something as simple as that you know what i mean it's just like you know for all of you out there if you don't know what a proper dress code is for musicians just wear black get it over with yeah. black shirt black jeans black sneakers you're done you know but, but, but nice but nice black but nice yes not, <laughs> not you know not hang black t-shirt no no and, you know an old wrangler black jeans mm -hmm. you know like get some hip blacks you know go to h&m yeah. you know go to H &M. Go, store, uh, right? yeah, exactly it won't cost too much right but you know it, it, it goes back to to that piece you know what i mean uh the, yeah. the career musician is all about balancing act you know and uh now, I think that's one of the greatest things that I've seen you, of course, with, with this podcast, getting everyone's input um, and just, you know, hipping everybody to the, the reality of what a career musician is and what's needed. And there's a lot of success stories, you know, even ourselves, we're success stories, you know, I mean, there's a lot of musicians who have not been able to do what we've done, but it, it wasn't just talent. We've had to learn a lot of other stuff, you know, social skills and business skills and and it's still to this day, you know, it goes out. I mean, this this last crazy trip that I just took, I was filling out forms to get into every country, you know, um, going back and forth. And if, if we couldn't even fill that out, how are you going to make it to the next place? You know what I mean? It's just the, the know-how. Okay, so you know, I have to bring that up. So first of all, the other day on, on uh, social media, I saw you and your father on the plane headed headed to, I think it was Nashville to, to do, to, you know, to do part of the album. And yeah. here's, here's what struck me. First of all, you were both wearing like nice suit jackets, you know, yes. <laughs> and, and you were sitting in first class. And I'm saying, I'm like, see, I'm like, now that's a, a classy career musician. That's how you know, you know, it's like, come on. Um, it's, it's a business. Don't, you know, don't dress bummy, present yourself yes. right. You know, be sure to, to do all the due diligence and collect that data because then you can collect your air miles and then you can get upgrades. Yes, and that's you know? exactly it. All of our years of travel has been from that. You it's, know, upgrade, you up mileage, hotel points. Hotel like Hotel points, yeah, yes. That's yes. All part of the business you and, know? Then, and then you get a business account and you have a credit card that earns you rewards on that card yep. and you get four points and more hotel you know so num number one but then number two what you just said filling out all the forms just for traveling and all you know customs and now with customs COVID. visas yep mm -hmm. now, i'm not going to bring anything up but you remember you and i have been on the road a couple times where certain <laughs> band members couldn't fill out those forms <laughs> <laughs> i'm like no if you don't know, you know, you got to have a handle on all that stuff, right? Yes. <laughs> so, you know. These that is a funny story there. We did yeah. experience that. <laughs> well, there was several, several with different situations. But, you know, yeah. So I'm so glad you brought that up. And like you said, now with the COVID restrictions. Yeah. You really have to be on top of that stuff. Most definitely. It's a, it's a totally different world, you know. I pray everyone to keep safe. You know, it's been a hard couple of years. There's been a lot of losses. You have had losses. I've had losses over here. Yes. Um, but, um, you know, uh, through these trials, you know, we, we kind of uh, come up and realize new things. You know, we appreciate things differently. Um, we've come up with new ways to work with each other. Right. I mean, yes. we've, you know, we, we've made we've we've made a way where there was no way, you know, mm -hmm. or we kind of looked like it was impossible, you know, uh, throughout all of this. And that perseverance, you know, comes from our, our kind of business background and, and drive of like, you know, we've as us as musicians, we've had to make our own buck every way. You know, if, if we weren't on a tour, we were trying to do a session. If it wasn't on a session. 
we were doing something for free for somebody so we can get to the next level, you know? That's right. And saying, hey, I'm available this day. You want to try me out for something? Let's go. Or, or if you want to send me some files, I'm available this day. Just check it out, you know? Um, and yeah, so throughout all of all of this stuff, we, we've kind of made a, a, a way where we didn't see possible before, you know? Um, and and really, you know, that that's the, the, the kind of main goal of life, right? You, you always want to love your passion. You always want to do well. You know, you want your family to do well. Um, but, you, you know, it's amazing when when you're able to do something that was not possibly there before. You know, that's why I think even us recording ourselves and being able to make music like, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, you were saying earlier, you might hate it and you might, you know, want to get rid of your stuff. But I think anyone who, who tries and, and goes in and, and goes to record themselves, whether it be a bass player, drummer or keyboard player or guitar player. I think the satisfaction of you of, of your creation um, will keep on driving you to do the next thing. You know, that's right. That's right. Uh, you and I had talked that I hate recording videos, right? And I've had to do it now. <laughs> but you know, it's kind of cool when all of a sudden, you know, I, I did some videos for Spawn Drums that was only being done in China, and mm -hmm. I got all these crazy new followers that I would have never. I was just like, what, where do these people come from? You know what I mean? And I've had some people request like video lessons that I would have never imagined. Like there's a, a whole different world out there of things that we can do, you know? Um, it, it's up to us to just pick that niche, right? What, what do we really have time for? What do we want to develop? And what is that niche that we want to like continue pushing forward? You know, I mean, there, there's different ways. I mean, I, I met a guitar player the other day from Miami um, who just does YouTube videos. He's an older gentleman my father's age and just does classical stuff like nylons type stuff yeah makes his career from it it's just he doesn't have to go nowhere he makes a does a bunch of lessons that's his passion that's his love and and to him in his eyes that's the success that he wanted you know what i mean i mean everyone has a different vision of their success but you know with, with our passion bro i think we're we're so fortunate to be able to do all that we do i mean you and i have stories for days you know Right. We, we can sit here and talk for hours and hours and hours and hours of, of all the things we've been able to do, all the, you know, artists we've been able to play for, you know. Uh, the other day I had to list, you know, just for a bio sake for one of the, the, the uh, head companies. And as I kept on listing and jotting down, I was like, holy crap, like, right. we've been able to play for a lot of heavy hitters, great guys, and we've been able to, to enjoy, you know, at the same time. It's so perfect because I always ask all my guests, how do you define success? And you just did it. So Ooh. that was perfect. That's the only way, man. I really feel like uh, I've, I've done it already. You know, if, yeah. if for some reason I couldn't do this anymore, I would still be happy. You know? That's right. Um, but I saw an old man play the other day. All right? Okay. Um, this was in India. Oh, wow. So I decided with my father that we were going to go to a jazz club in New Delhi. Nice. Right? Nice. Which, that by itself is his own like <laughs> yeah. India jazz club, right? We were just like, ah, oh, let's just, you know, see what happens. Let's look it up and see what, you know, what 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 pops up, you know. So bro, we end up in an Uber, right? And putting an address in India is a hell of a hard time. So I finally get the Uber, I finally get the address. It takes us like one or two blocks away. We're still lost, right? So we get out the car. We're walking in New Delhi. We're just walking down the block, and we finally see the jazz club, you know? And it's this old school place, bro, and it's like bricks, you know? Um, real old building. Think of, like, it, it's almost weird. Like, I don't know if it's been there like that or not, but it reminded me like an old school jazz club, this all brick, you know? And like in the village in Soho. Oh, so, nice. you know, they, they made it seem like that. It was like these two little floors, but, you know, it was just on top of each other. And man, there was this guy that I swear to you, he's probably like 75, 77, you know, with his old school beard and just playing, bro. And he was the happiest man ever, bro. Wow. And me and my father looked at each other and we were like, if we're 70 something and doing that, I would be fine, man. That's right. I'll be fine. Wow. And I loved it. So I would have never expected some 70 year old man playing jazz in New Delhi, an Indian man. <laughs> but that's, that's cool, was. man. Yeah. So that that made me for sure say, oh man, 
You know, if I can end up like that, I'll be happy. You know, but I we've done. That. You and I have done, of course, way more than that. But to be able to still love your instrument at that old age and not be jaded and just right, it's a good thing. right. Mm-hmm. That is man. That wow, that's amazing. And you know, thank you because th- again, perfect segue. I always ask all my guests, how do you, you know, any words of wisdom for you know for a young musician aspiring you know they're like you said they're really good at their craft but Mm -hmm. now they want they want to turn it into a career yeah man the one thing that i've always said and and it's proven even with the whole baby face thing when you called me say yes try it all Mm. don't say no you're not you're not uh quote unquote too good for anything. <laughs> ah, that's a good one. You know? Yes. Yeah, you know, say yes, see where it leads, you know, something new, try it out. It works in music, it works in business, it works in everywhere. Just say yes. The day you think and something's beneath you, you'll never grow again, man. Mm. Mm-hmm. And man, that that goes for anything in life, by the way. You know? Yeah, most definitely. You know, when you look at all the people right now, I love this this uh, website, M- Masterclass. You know, uh-huh. yes, you yep. can learn from the the legendary greatest of the greats in any field. Yes, and you know, and they all tell you the same thing: if once you stop learning, once you think you've arrived, you're you're dead in the water. Mm-hmm. You Without know. a doubt, learn a language, learn something. You know, do do something, but just say yeah. Say yes to the next thing and see where it takes you, man. You I'm, know? I'm so glad you brought that up because I also wanted to mention, and I, I almost forgot, your Puerto Rican descent, you're, you're bilingual, and you learned, you know, how to play all of the Latin rhythms, you know, yes. innately. You have all of that. Which came first? Did you start with the Latin stuff or did you start with, like, American music? What what came first? No, I started with, with uh, Latin stuff first. That's what I, I said. Yeah. yeah, it was just, it was all over the house. It was all over the music, you know. There was bells and bongos somewhere in the corner. Wow. You know, uh, the Puerto Rican people do something called a paranda on Christmas. And you go from house to house with guitars and wow. maracas and bongos and these little hand drums. So... As a kid, you're already, you know, getting into it and, and listening and, and you know, kind of absorbing that, you know. So <clears throat> it went, it was kind of, it became a little easier as I then started listening to more uh, American music, quote unquote American music. Right, right, right. I don't even know what that is anymore, but. <laughs> yeah, technically not American, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> It all stems from Africa. Exactly. <laughs> right. But, you know, it, it was like, you know, quote unquote, the top 40. We was playing the top 40. Right. Whatever decade it was, you know what I mean, as a kid. Um, but, yeah, I started with the Latin music and still to today. I always still turn on Latin music to, you know, to for enjoyment or to listen to or to try, you know, something new. And there's always something there. But I started with that first and then uh, it went into my drumming uh, after that. Okay. And then how did you, how did you get into being a producer from the drumming? Well, from the, from the drumming, it was kind of, uh, I was started learning all this technical stuff from either engineering when I was into doing these sessions. Oh, right. And, um, and, uh, there was a a Spanish guy who was wanting to do some uh, hip hop tracks during that time. It was like 93, 92, something like that. Didn't you grow up in the in the Lower East Village? Of Lower East Side, Manhattan. Manhattan. Yep. Yeah. Right on time. With yeah. all the hip hop stuff from the Bronx to yeah. uh, Manhattan to Brooklyn stuff, and some guys wanted to learn how to do some. So, or he wanted to produce some some hip hop tracks. So I knew how to use his machine, and I started banging out these beats first, and then I got into playing keys a little bit, and then I started producing these tracks little by little, and from that came. You know, to uh, to the one point when I started doing remixes for like we did Seal remixes, Backstreet Boy ones, we did In Sync ones, we wow. did uh, all this Justin Timberlake remixes. That's how Ziggy and I, you know, got together. But it was from that thing. So it went from you know kind of making these tracks uh, to then doing remixes, then to full fledged you know producing um, from all those elements. And really, you know, the remix world taught us a lot. We were able to dissect because they would give us the tracks of everything you know what i mean so we had full vocals we had full guitars and it was our choice what to chop up what to use so we would we would hit tones and we were like how the heck did they get that and it was a great you know school of art right there you know wow 
And that's how the production came little by little after that. And then talking about being in the hotbed, it's so funny because we grew up kind of close, you know, and we're, we're in the same age group. I was growing up on Long Island, New York. You were growing up in Manhattan. Can yep. you can you imagine have we met back then? That would have been awesome. I would have loved that. <laughs> but then we en- ended up meeting in Nashville. I mean, in Nashville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, out of all the places, yeah. you know. Nuts. Um, even when I left to Nashville, people were like, where are you going? Where's that? <laughs> Right. That's, funny. That's funny. It was that long ago, you know. And now you know? Nashville is its own hotbed, man. It's it like, is, you know. know? Yeah. It's just there recently, and I love seeing it. Like, right. you know, what, what you and I would have hoped Nashville would have become when we were there, you know, with the diversity and right. music diversity, it's finally become that. Become that. You know? Yeah. You know, about 10 years after us, but yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. It, it's become it, you know. That's incredible. That's incredible. And by the way, you do owe me those pictures and videos of I Ed, do. Edwin's studio. I can't wait to see that. It's amazing. Yeah. We, I, we we need to get like a little, uh, like do just a little videography of his room and explaining it yes. and put it on one of your podcasts just for people to see or on the website. Well, it's you know what? Video. You know what would be dope? We'll meet over there. You and I will both fly there. We'll record some music. Yeah, and we'll do the video at the same time. That's what we'll do. That would be the way to go. There you go. Done. We have a plan. The next thing, Edwin, That's get right. ready. We're coming to your place. <laughs> All, right. All right. Now, so you ready for some rapid fire? Oh, go for it. What All is right. this? Like old school, like David Letterman used to throw the cards. Yeah. All right. Favorite restaurant or food? Oh, Biagio's, New York. Done. Hidden talents. Ah, painting. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Song or band that changed your life? The what? Song or band or artist that changed your life? You're going to be surprised. Spiral Gyro. Oh, wow. Yeah, I like that. Uh huh. Good old fashioned elevator music. No, yes, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, those guys were killer. I'm kidding. Oh, it is the weirdest thing. It was my first record I even bought. You know, I had all cool. these other crazy things, and that record came up, and I was like, let me see what this is. And, and by the uh, way, they're all millionaires now. So. Yeah, they're all good. Yes. <laughs> So that's okay. All right. I love that. Name three tour essentials. Can't leave home without it. Oh, my Lord. Laptop, shaver, <laughs> and an extra credit card, just in case. <laughs> and I like the extra credit card. That's yeah, just a, you got stranded in the middle of nowhere. Oh, Go. We have been in some remote areas. I'll tell you oh, what. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's crazy. All right. Last concert you attended, but you didn't work. Oh, snap. BTS. Wow. Did you hear that? My daughter. Yep. That was recent then. Yeah, that was a couple years. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Instrument you wish you played? <sighs> Bass. Studio or live? Which do you prefer? Studio. Ah, I think I do too. Top yeah. three artists in your playlist? Oh, Mark Anthony. Good one. Alejandro Sanz, which I love to death. And Earth and Fire. There you go. Bam. Your friends would say you are hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> I would say, you know what? I would say you're the greatest guy in the world. It's like oh, no. Richie is the nicest guy you'll ever meet. Trust Look, me. Look, this is what they got me one year. Ah, see, Mr. Wonderful. Also known as the nicest guy ever. I told you. <laughs> I love it. All right. As as a musician, you're an entertainer, but what entertains you? Oh, movies. Movies. See, that's another thing we have. Love movies. Remember all the movies we used to go see on the road? Yes, that was our thing to go watch some movies yeah. whenever you got a chance. And a matter of fact, Mr. Edmonds, Babyface himself, he was the first one. He'd be like, "All right, yep. let's go see a movie tonight after the gig." Yeah. Yep. And we would go like to see the midnight show, and I would always fall asleep. <laughs> And you know what's funny? There was enough restaurants, there was enough places to hang, but that was like the place where we got a chance to just chill. chill. You didn't have to be on. You didn't have to worry about nothing. It was just right. chill. Right. I agree. Now, we've been all over the world, and I think I know the answer to this, but your favorite city? Man, it still has to be Moscow, man. Moscow? Man. You changed it. I changed it, bro. Wow. I changed it. And it's only happened over the last, like, five years. Yeah. You know what my answer will always be? New York. New York, Manhattan. Yeah, I figured. Of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, man, I've now, like, love, love 
Like it's a New York and a London combined on steroids. Wow. Over 20 million people, bro. That's an interesting way of putting it. I like that. Yeah. 20 most, million people. Wow. Yeah. It has the vibe of New York with anything you want 24 seven. Yeah. And it has the historic culture of the London, you know, right. except way bigger. You know, yeah, like thousands of years old culture. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, but still, I'm still a New Yorker, no matter what. <laughs> okay, okay. And I think I know the answer to this one: drink of uh -oh. choice. The what? Your drink of choice. Ah, uh, whiskey, bourbon. Whiskey, but old fashioned, right? Old fashioned. Yeah. Yep. That's I got a water it. jug here, but oh man, I'm drinking an old fashioned in spirit with you. All there right. you go. Uh, favorite decade of music? Man, 80s. 80s. Okay. I think 80s had everything. I agree with that. Uh, you've collaborated with the best of the best. What is your dream collaboration, dead or alive? Ooh, you know who I really, really, really enjoy? I would love to see someone like Kenny with a Luis Miguel. A baby ah. face. I think the music would be unheard of. That's interesting. And those are yeah. the two odd things to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. But without a doubt, bro. So you you played the with musicality Dave. of both of those guys. Yeah. And their songmanship, unbelievable. So you played with Babyface for years, but you've never played with Luis Miguel then. No, I I was actually recording something with David Foster for him. But oh, you that have? was the closest. Yeah, but I've never met the guy I wish I could I've a matter of fact um every time he was somewhere in my area that I could go backstage or go see him I was on tour somewhere uh, and I never 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 got a chance wow that would be a great one yeah that, so I'm still hoping for that to see that one day there you go that would be good I gave you all odd answers at the end bro that's, that's excellent all right <laughs> and finally all right give me a drum roll finally here we go you ready <laughs> What would you do if you couldn't be a career musician anymore? Oh, you know what? I would be a bartender. Man, you would make the best. You would make, <laughs> I guarantee you, you would be a millionaire as a bartender. People would give you so many tips. You would make so much. You would probably walk away with like $10,000 a night. Oh, I would just talk to everyone all night. <laughs> I'm telling you, you would make the most tips ever in the history of bartenders. <laughs> oh, man. I like that. I like that. That's a good one, man. My brother, Richie Pena, man. Thank yes. you so much. Love you, know, man. It's always a pleasure. Always good to see you. I mean, anytime we get to spend together, man, is, is always a plus on my end, man. I enjoy it to the max, bro. Absolutely. Love you back, man.